An entire book could be written analyzing the extraordinary content of the literary masterpiece Earth's Earliest Ages, penned in 1876 by George H. Pember. But in these short episodes, my objective is to provide a mere cursory review and to highlight what I believe to be some of the more critical points. In the last episode, I explained Pember's thesis concerning what is known as the gap theory and the probability of a pre-Adamite world. However, Earth's earliest ages is not only a treatise on the age before man, but also an insightful exposition on the fall of man and the age preceding the fall, which provoked the Great Flood. Building upon his primary thesis, the interval of a pre-Adamic world between verses 1 and 2 of the book of Genesis, Pember paints us a grim picture of the earth before the commencing of what he views as a process of restoration rather than initial creation. It is a world desolate and empty, covered in brooding waters and veiled with impenetrable darkness in the wake of some terrible judgment. Then, startling the deep silence and peeling over the black floods of ruin, was heard the thunder of the voice of the Almighty, and the command went forth, Light be. Instantly it flashed from the womb of darkness and illuminated the rolling globe, but only to reveal an overspreading waste of waters. Many intriguing observations are made by Pember concerning the process of the Earth's restoration which he contends consisted of six literal 24-hour days. For example, he notes that the creation of light on the planet did not originally spring from the sun, but was possibly magnetic like the terrestrial light of the aurora borealis. He propounds that this record of the existence of light apart from the sun is a proof of the divine origin of the scriptures in anticipation of science. Another noteworthy observation concerns the second day of restoration, in which the firmament was placed between the waters, but not pronounced good. Pember contends, There is, however, in the account of this day's work, an omission which is probably significant. For the usual conclusion, and God saw that it was good, is in this case left out. And since the reasons ordinarily given for the omission are unsatisfactory, we venture to suggest the following explanation. May not the withholding of God's approval be a hint of the immediate occupation of the firmament by demons, those, indeed, which are its present inhabitants? Since they were concerned in the fall of man, they must have speedily appeared in the newly formed atmosphere. May they not, therefore, have been imprisoned in the deep, and having found some way of escape at the lifting of the waters, have swarmed into the dominion of the air, of which their leader is prince? In this case, the firmament might have been teeming with them before the close of the second day. And we need not wonder that God refused to pronounce their kingdom good. Progressing from the six-day restoration of the earth, Pember naturally advances to the creation of man, in which he gives a very interesting exposition on the doctrine of man's threefold nature referring, of course, to his body, soul, and spirit. He wisely discerns that, of all man's marvelous propensities, his intellect is the most dangerous of gifts, unless it be guided by the Spirit of God. For, quote, It can call evil good, and good evil. It can put darkness for light, and light for darkness, bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Nay, the wave of its magic wand can fill not only this life, but even the region beyond the river of death, with sunny landscapes and fair scenes, to all of which it is able to give the semblance of a firm reality, until the fatal moment which separates spirit and body, when in an instant the brilliant vista is blotted out forever by the fiery darkness of the lost. Pember's Insights on the Garden of Eden and on the fall of man are remarkable. He points out that many of the dynamics of Adam and Eve's relationship are analogous to the relationship between Christ and his church. He writes, for example, By naming the animal kingdom, Adam took possession of his dominion before the appearance of the woman, so that she shared his lordship over creation, not in her own right, but as being bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh 
and herein we may discern an evident type of the second Adam and his bride. For the church, though all things are hers, will possess them through no merit or right of her own, but only as the bride of him who is the heir of all things. Pember addresses the temptation of Eve by the serpent and the subtleties that led to her act of infamous insubordination, resulting in the terrible curse of sin and death that we all bear in our bodies. He also points out that Adam was not deceived, as Paul makes clear in the New Testament, but most likely chose to share in his wife's fate willingly, motivated by excessive love for her. Again, an allusion to Christ. He spends a considerable amount of time describing the plight of Adam and Eve after they were expelled from the luxury of the Garden of Eden and thrust into a bleak world blighted with barrenness and hardship in which man was forced to labor with a cursed ground which now brought forth thorns and thistles. He explains that mankind dealt with expulsion from the garden and the curse revo- resulting from sin in two very distinct ways. The unrighteous labored to mitigate the hardship by the power and ingenuity of their own minds, placing their hope in the futility of the flesh, while the righteous patiently endured the hardship and looked hopefully to a promised redemption. Fit objects, then, are the thorn and the thistle, to remind man of the curse. And keeping their origin in view, we can see a deep significance in that awful scene when our Lord suffered himself to be crowned with thorns, so that even his enemies set him forth as the great curse-bearer, when he wore on his bleeding brow that which owed its very existence to, and was the sign of, the sin which he had come to expiate. Pember refers to the days of Adam and his progeny before the flood as the second age, or the age of freedom, in which men were restrained neither by government nor law. He explains, And first, in what we may term the age of freedom, during the lapse of which he left Adam and his descendants almost entirely to their own devices. Marriage had indeed been instituted, and they were instructed to approach God by means of typical sacrifices and commanded to toil for their bread by tilling the earth. But beyond this, God would neither himself issue laws nor suffer men to do so. The sword of the magistrate might not be used for the repression of crime. Even the murderer should be unpunished, as we may see by the case of Cain. No government was permitted. Every man should go in his own way, and do that which was right in his own eyes. Thus the fitness of man for a condition of extreme liberty, and the worth of a trust in the innate justice supposed to lie at the bottom of the human heart, have been already tested by the great Creator. Modern philosophers are urging a repetition of the experiment, but the history of the times of old proves the fallacy of their views. For the wickedness of man became great, all flesh corrupted its way upon the earth, and the earth was filled with violence. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Concerning the days of Noah, Pember has much to say. He believed that the very same vices that led to the judgment of the great flood in the second age were destined to be repeated in the closing chapter of this present age, and so lead to the final judgment that will descend upon the earth in a fury of fire before the coming of the Lord. He takes particular interest in what he terms the eruption of fallen angels into the world of men, as recorded in Genesis 6, which subsequently fomented an explosion of rebellion and wickedness that brought the world to ruin. Pember defines seven causes of antediluvian corruption and analyzes the extent of their influence in the society of his day. As we review these seven points, we must keep in mind that they were written in 1876. They may be summed up as follows. 1. A tendency to worship God as Elohim, that is, merely as the Creator and Benefactor, and not as Jehovah, the covenant God of mercy, dealing with the transgressors who are appointed to destruction and finding a ransom for them. 2. An undue prominence of the female sex and a disregard of the primal law of marriage. 3. 
a rapid progression in the mechanical arts and the consequent invention of many devices whereby the hardships of the curse were mitigated and life was rendered more easy and indulgent. Also a proficiency in the fine arts, which captivated the minds of men and helped to induce an entire oblivion of God. 4. An alliance between the nominal church and the world, which speedily resulted in a complete amalgamation. 5. A vast increase in population. 6. The rejection of the preaching of Enoch, whose warnings thus became a savor of death unto the world, and hardened men beyond recovery. 7. The appearance upon the earth of beings from the principality of the air, and their unlawful intercourse with the human race. It should be abundantly apparent to any rational mind that these seven causes of antediluvian corruption are not only present in the society of the 21st century, but have greatly metastasized and grown to full maturity since the late 19th century, when Pember first recognized them in the dawn of their infancy. In other words, although these seven points accurately describe the days in which George Pember lived, they are frighteningly more relevant to the days in which we now live portending the imminence of the final judgment and destruction of this world and the return of the king. Stay tuned for the final analysis on the book, Earth's Earliest Ages. Reporting for SteveQuayle.com, I'm Timothy Alberino, and that's my analysis.